Welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Metrology by CT. My name is Florian Knigge and I am today's presenter. I'm the technical leader for metrology with Wege Technologies, the former sensing and inspection branch of GE. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Please know we do capture all these questions. A copy of today's slide deck um, and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find helpful. And now, without further ado, we will just start with our Metrology by CT webinar. This webinar will be divided into three um, segments. The first one, I want to talk a little bit about the CT metrology applications. So what can we use the CT metrology system for? Which kind of applications are out there that we can cover with CT metrology? And the second one, I want to give a little bit of background on metrology uh, itself and how it uh, kind of works with a CT and what are the differences to maybe other metrology um, techniques out there. And in the last segment, I want to talk about our technical solutions. So what did we as Wege Technologies um, come up with to make our CT systems as accurate and as precise as they can be? So first, let's have a look at the CT metrology applications. So what fields of industry can this technology be used in? So as you can see here on this slide, it can be used pretty much everywhere. So um, it starts with aviation, automotive, electronics, so everything on the left-hand side, these are the segments, and there might be many, many more. So if you were able to join one of our last uh, webinars um, from our product management side, um, you probably got a very good overview of what CT in general is used for and in which fields of industry the CT can be used for. And Basically, in every field where we have the, let's call it standard CT for, for NDT, for non-destructive testing purposes, this is also an, uh, a segment where you might have a look on, uh, on whether or not CT metrology is an option. And most of the time, the, quest, uh, the answer is yes, it is an option. So pretty much everything that you can think about when it comes to CT also applies to CT metrology. And from, from which area of, of the industry? Um, well, it, it starts with, with production ramp up. Um, and it goes all the way down to uh, analysis of field, uh, field failure. So it's pretty much the whole life cycle of, of your product. So even before you even start with production, back to when the, when the part is delivered to the customer and fails in the field and comes back. So um, pretty much everywhere um, you, you can use CT metrology, um, and hopefully in this presentation you will see what is the benefit of this. So if you have an application that you're at the moment uh, doing with, with, let's call it conventional metrology equipment, so something like a coordinate measurement machine or an optical scanner, it's always an, an, a good idea to think and rethink how you're doing it and think whether or not um, CT metrology might also be an option for that. And of course, uh, we are here to, to help you answer these questions by doing trials on your parts and by um, by doing test runs and, and see whether or not this technology is feasible for your specific application. So as I mentioned, it's pretty much everywhere. It's, um, it's, it's, it's getting more and more in the industry. We have now customers in pretty much all the segments you can see on the left-hand side. And I'm pretty sure that in the future, it will, it will, we will find other segments that maybe even we haven't thought about yet. So um, everywhere we're doing measurements, there's room for CT as well. So now that we talked about where it can be used, I want to talk a little bit about how it's done. So um, what are the typical ways on using a CT system for metrology, for, for measurements? And the, the most basic one uh, that you can think of is just doing a so-called nominal actual comparison. So what you have there is on the left-hand side, you have some sort of CAD model, like a, um, a ideal model out of your, of your CAT system, or you have an, maybe an STL or some sort of golden sample. And on the right-hand side, what you can see is a, is a CT volume. So it's a fully 3D representation of your part, a CT scan, 
for those of you who are not too familiar with the, with the CT and X-ray um, field, what we basically do is we take a, a whole bunch of, um, of X-ray 2D images from different angles, and then we combine them, what we call the reconstruction, to generate this uh, 3D image that is here rendered on the right-hand side. So what the nice thing about the CT always is you have a full representation of your part. There's uh, the inside and especially the out, uh, sorry, the outside and especially the inside of the part as well is um, is fully covered. So you don't only have the surface information like with an optical scanner, for example, but you have all the information that is maybe hidden inside. So that's uh, a very nice thing about the X-ray and the CT. So here, what we want to do is we want to take this um, CAD file, the ideal geometry of the of the part, that how our designers and our company um, thought of this part and how it's supposed to look like. And then on the right hand side, we take the real life part, we do a CT scan, and what we can do then is just with a very very simple um, software, of, with a very simple software workflow, just with a few clicks, um, we can then compare the the nominal data to the actual data. And that's what you can see here. So from the uh, left-hand side, from the CAD file, and from the CT volume on the right-hand side, we just combine them in our software. It's really just a few clicks, and you get this nice uh, color map of your of your deviations. So what you can see, for example, in this part here, that at um, at some areas it is all, it's green, which means there's no deviation. So the nominal and the actual part are at this position the same or the deviation between the surfaces to be precise of these two parts is, is, um, is zero or close to zero. And the brighter the colors get from purple or uh, to purple, and blue to purple, that means that the deviation is, is negative. So the nominal part is uh, at this um, position bigger than the actual part and vice versa for the, for the yellowish and, and red kind of colors. So what we can see on this part, on this part for example, on the very top, you can see these two, um, two purple um, half circles, let's call it. And that just tells us that there's a huge deviation in, in this area for the, uh, for, the nom for the part compared to the CAD file. So with just a very, very simple um, workflow, just a few clicks, we get a full idea of how our, um, our actual part is kind of uh, deviating from, from the nominal part. And in many cases, this is, this is all you need, uh, especially when you t think about setting up a process, setting up a production process. Um, in, the, in the early stages, you, you might not be interested in, in, the, in the full GD&T um, representation of your part. You just want to have a basic idea of uh, where things are going. So you tweak some, some parameters on your, on your setup. You do another CT scan of the, next, uh, of the next part that comes out of this process, and then you can see, well, it worked or didn't work, or the direction is the right one or the wrong one. So very easy, very quick to do, um, especially nowadays with a very fast CT scanners that we offer that, are, that can run CT scan in some 30 or 40 seconds, um, and then just a little bit of software involved afterwards, and you get this nice view. And as I mentioned, in many cases, and I've seen this with many customers, in many cases, this is really all you need. You don't have to go all the way. Of course, we can do that, and we'll talk about that later on. But um, this is a very good first indicator um, on how to use CT metrology in a very easy and simple way. And of course, there's much more that we can do, and we're going to talk about that in the, on the next slides. What you can, of course, also do is the full GD&T as it's specified in the ISO standards, so doing the a geometric dimensioning and tolerancing like flatnesses, angles, distances, all these kind of things that you probably know from other metrology equipment. Of course, this can also, this can also be done in a, with a CT scan. And the nice thing about the CT always is once you have done your CT scan of your part, you have a full virtual representation of your part inside your, inside your computer, living inside your memory, basically, inside your, on your hard drive. So um, once the scan is done, you can basically take out the, the part of, uh, out of your CT system, maybe scan the next one, but you can still work on this virtual, um, yeah, virtual representation of your part. And nothing is stopping you from doing one, a hundred, or even a thousand measurements um, because you have all the information already there. Once the scan is done, everything is, is there. So there's no need to, to run another physical measurement on your part. It's just about a few clicks and setting up the measurements in your, in your computer afterwards. So, and one of the very uh, common workflows um, is, is doing actually the 
defining the measurements even before you did the CT scan. So, for example, if you're thinking about a production environment where we use the same part over and over again, and every now and then we want to scan one of those parts, or we even want to scan each and every part, so 100% inspection, then we can even, before we even start producing this actual part, our designers can um, set up the, the measurements for this part even beforehand, before we even, even start scanning. So that's something that you can see here, for example, on this, uh, this green one, remember from before, this is our CAD model, so a virtual representation of our part. Uh, ideal geometry, and we can then define our, our measurements on this CAD model itself. So we can, for example, um, on the left-hand side, you can see all these bright green dots are our measurement points, our fitting points. So, and these fitting points then uh, um, get, get used to create our planes, our cylinders, our cones, whatever there is. And, and these then can be tolerance and dimension. So on the right-hand side, you can see some, some flatnesses, some perpendicularity and all these kind of things. And again, this is all done even before we even did the CT scan. So we create these, what we call a measurement template, so um, or measurement plan. So we can create this, and this does not necessarily have to be done by the CT operator. It can even be done by some of our our colleagues in, in the construction department, in the, in the engineering department. So the people that actually design this part, they can also um, design the the measurement itself, so what, that's what we call the PMI data. So we can actually do that in our CAD problem itself while creating the part itself. And once this is done, it is very easy then to transfer this measurement template onto our actual CT scan. And here you can see how, the, how it looks on the CT scan itself. So it is really basically just a, a copy and paste, just like Control C and Control V in your in your Word or Excel file. You copy your measurement template from your CAD model onto your actual part. Of course, there you have to think about alignments and all these kind of things. But if once you've done that, it, it really comes very as a very natural thing. Just copy and paste your measurement template onto your CT part. And now we can see, of course, on the left hand side again we have the the fitting points. And these fitting points are again color coded. So green means um, that, for example, on the on the on the bottom we have this green cylinder. That means that the cylinder itself is pretty much a cylinder, very very round and very even. But on the on the inner cylinder, on this inner um, cylinder, you can see some red and some some yellow dots. That just means that there's some deviation from the ideal geometry. And of course, it's a real life part, so of course there are deviations. So um, you can see here just by looking at the fit points, of course, that there is some deviations. But what you actually want to do is you want to do the real GD and T, the ge geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. And on the right-hand side, you can see now that we have, again, the same features as we had defined before on our CAD model. And you can, and, and for example, you can see on the top that there is a, a flatness with a little red bubble to it. That means that this flatness is here out of tolerance. So you can not only measure, you can, of course, also make good, good or bad decisions. So um, uh, inside or outside tolerance decisions. And this can, of course, done, all be done fully automated. So um, if you set it up once properly, there's no need for, for any user to even do any measurements himself. It's just setting up the, the measurement template, clicking a button on your CT scan, and all the other things, if you want to, can run automatically. Of course, you can also do everything manually. So you don't even need a CAD file because we have some of our, our customers are in the inspection services business, and they they just get one or two parts from, from their customers and telling them, well, can you, can you do a measurement of this cylinder or of this plane or of this distance or whatever? And then you can, of course, also measure directly on the CT part itself. So there's no need to see a CAD file. This is more in a production environment where you're scanning the same part over and over again, helping you to set it up properly. You can always just do manual CT scan, load your CT data into your software that you use for evaluations, and then run this run the measurements directly on the part. So that's also an option. I just wanted to show um, how, you, how you can do it if you have um, a more, let's call, call it automated uh, way and a more, more streamlined process. And this is especially important in, in a production environment where you're scanning the same part over and over again. I personally, I wouldn't go through the hassle of setting everything up um, on my CAD file and importing that and aligning it and, and combining these two, two objects if I just want to measure one distance or one, one, one diameter of one cylinder in my part, I would just do a CT scan, open it up, click on the cylinder, measure it, and close it again. So, but of course, if you, if you think more about a, 
production process where you have the same part over and over again, as I said, uh, then this comes in very handy. And it can also help to, to eliminate the influence of users because everything that you automate, of course, um, you, you minimize or you uh, eliminate the user influence in this. So uh, also very handy uh, in this automation um, environment to make sure that you have repeatable and reproducible results as well. And one of the very nice things that you can also do is you can combine different analysis. So you can, on the left-hand side, you can see you combine the GD and T, the flatness, perpendicularity, whatever it is, with a color map of this normal action comparison. Because as I said, it is all just data once you've done the CT scan. And you can then run different analysis without having to redo the scan. Because once you have the data, and you can also run another analysis three years later, as long as you store the data long enough. So even if your part, if, if the part doesn't exist anymore, you can still go back to your part and do just another measurement or do just another analysis. And because our CT systems are, are full, full capable CT systems, not only for metrology, but also for all the G, uh, NDT, non-destructive testing purposes, you can then, of course, also combine it with other analyses, like, for example, porosities. So in this, on the right-hand side, you can see we have all the gray value information, all the inside information of our part, so we can see porosities and we can, of course, also evaluate them. And this can be done automatically or manually as well. So combining these, these different forms of, of analysis on, on one, and the, one and the same data set is a very big advantage when it comes to CT because you have the full representation of your part. And now before we continue with our, with our webinar, I just want to get some feedback from you, and we have a little poll question for you to answer. So our first question here is, are you using a CT system for metrology? Now we'll just give you a few seconds to answer this question before we continue. Okay, now that we have covered the CT metrology applications, um, I want to spend a few slides talking about what I call the metrology background. And it's mostly to get us all on the same page, and especially for those uh, who have not the metrology background um, in their daily work and not the experience and also not the, the experience with CT. So just because for the last chapter of this presentation, we need to have some understanding of how this works and what is the difference between different CT technology. So I've been talking about metrology quite a lot already, but I think it is very important for us to have a definition of what that actually is. Um, if, you, if you go onto Google or onto any other search engine and just type in metrology, there's all sorts of things popping up. And um, what I really like is a definition by the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. And that they state that metrology is the science of measurement, embracing both experimental and theoretical determinations at any level of uncertainty in any field of science and technology. And for me, the very important part is what I marked here in green is at any level of uncertainty. So if we talk about metrology in this sense, um, it is not be about being very accurate. It's about knowing how accurate you are. And I think this is a very important um, distinction here. So if, you if you're looking for metrology equipment, CT or any other equipment, it is not about having the most precise or the most accurate uh, equipment out there. It's about having the right equipment for your application. For example, if you, if you want to build a, let's say, if you want to build a wooden table um, and you, you want to measure the, the length and the width of, of this table, you don't need one micron of accuracy, right? So you don't need a very, very expensive equipment. It might just be that you have a, a meter stick and you just take it and measure it and that's fine for this particular application. But of course, if you have high precision parts manufactured in your, in your company, then you might have a look at a few microns. So it's always knowing how accurate you are and knowing what accurate, accuracy you need for your specific application. That's, I think, very important to understand. So and having this in mind, this definition of any level of uncertainty, everything that you measure with is metrology equipment. So on the left-hand side, a caliper is of course not as sophisticated, let's say, as a CMM machine, an optical scanner, or anything else, but it is metrology equipment because it has a certain accuracy, 
has certain specifications and you can do measurements with it. Of course, for, for many of the, of the things that we're talking about uh, in, in our daily life, it's probably not precise enough, but in many cases it is. So it's really um, just understanding what you need for your particular application. And so in this sense also, the CT now with the CT metrology, the computer tomography, just is, is in the same line as all this other equipment. Like this, it's just an, another, and maybe a newer, but it's just another technology for measuring. And each of these of these technologies has its its pros and cons. And there's of course a lot of pros that CT brings to the table uh, that have not been been there before. For example, uh, hidden structures, um, especially in additive manufacturing, of course, where we have very complex parts that we can now see non-destructively that we couldn't see before with other equipment. But of course, there's always where there's pros, there's cons. So um, for each, for example, if you have very high density parts, you might reach a limit of a, of a CT system. Um, so it's always important to understand that it's just another metrology tech technology with some different pros and cons. And we are here to help you decide whether or not this technology is, is worth pursuing in, in your particular case. So if you have some some parts that you think might be might benefit from from doing a CT in terms of metrology or any other purpose, NDT purpose, um, just contact us and we'll, we'll try it out. But again, as, as I said, CT is just another approach on metrology. And of course, um, we have to make sure that, that we can compare these results. And I'll talk about that in the, in the next slides. So, um, but before we get there, um, we will have our second out of three questions for you to answer, um, because I'm really curious to see what our audience has experience with CT and CT metrology in particular. So our second question here is, are you using other metrology equipment? And I'll, again, I'll give you just a few seconds to answer. What I want to do now is I want to just give a, one example on how, how important it is to have the right uh, measurement strategy if you want to compare different results from different technologies. So, for example, here we have a CMM, a coordinate measurement machine, and a CT machine. And the typical approach, if you want to, want to measure a hole, like shown in, the, in this picture here, um, would be with a coordinate measurement machine. For example, you pick some eight points on top and eight points on the bottom of this, of this hole. Um, in a, like in a circle, you combine these circles and, and fit a cylinder into this kind of point cloud of these 16 points, and then you measure the diameter of this of this uh, cylinder, this fitted cylinder. If you, for example, want to know the the diameter of this hole, with the CT, as I mentioned before, we have a, a fully uh, full representation of the part. We have all the information available, uh, only limited by the resolution of our detector, basically. So. We have a lot of a lot of information, so why not use it? So what we typically do with the CT is we take all the points we can get. It can be 10,000 or even more points, as you can see here in, in red on this slide. All each every each of these tiny little red dots um, is one measurement point, so it, it's in the thousands or 10,000s. And now I just want to give you a quick example, um, just an easy example on how these different approaches can lead to different results and why we have to be careful if we talk about comparing different measurement uh, or metrology technologies. So let's assume this is the kind of the, this hourglass shape is what our hole looks like in real life. So if we now take the different approaches to, to measure these holes, that's what we do. On the left-hand side, you have a couple of points on the top and a couple of points on the bottom, whereas with a CT, um, just indicated by this dotted line here, we have points all over the place, all over the surface. And what we then do after we extracted these measurement points, we fit a cylinder um, into these into these points. So in this case, we did a Gauss fit. So we're looking for the least square error of these, of these points for the cylinder that creates the least square error in, in all these points. And as you can even see with the naked eye, the results are different, right? The diameter of this, of this measurement is different. So it's a different measurement result. And now uh, you, the question always is, which one is correct? Um, and I would argue, well, none of them is because it is not a cylinder at all. So we have to take one step back and think about What's our goal here? What do we want to measure? Is it to, more, for example, do we want to fit a rod in this, in this hole? Then 
well, both of the measurements are useless but that we did. And there's much more to this, but I just want to raise some awareness of uh, it is not so easy to compare different technologies. So if you just take the measurement results from CMM and compare them to the measurement results from CT, in the first place you might, might get different results. That does not mean one of the te techniques is better than the other. It just means that the strategies you're using are not comparable. So it is just to raise, again, to raise some awareness. If you run into these, these comparison studies that you typically do when you think of, consider using, make sure that it is comparable. For example, you use the same number of points on this. Why use the CT in the first place? Why throw away all this information that we have available? So it's always important to take a step back and think, what is the purpose of my measurement? Um, what is the functional purpose of this measurement? And then we can align the strategy, the measurement strategy accordingly. So, to understand the next slides when I will talk about our technical solutions, we have to get some basic um, background on how CT works and especially how CT um, works in, in terms of metrology. So for those of you have, who have no, no experience with, with CT, um, basic concept is always the same. It's some sort of optical magnification. So uh, in this very simplified graph here, on the left-hand side, we have some sort of X-ray source, I call it here the focal spot. So this on the left hand side, the little point is where our X-ray is created or emitted. So this is where where our yeah where our X-ray tube uh, is at and where the focal spot of this X-ray tube is at. And then in the middle we have what I call the object. So this is our path, the part we want to scan. Um, whatever that that might be, our aluminum casting, our plastic connector, or whatever. And on the right hand side we have some sort of uh, detector. Typically in these metrology machines you always find a flat panel detector, 2000 by 2000 or 4000 by 4000 uh, pixels. So this will um, detect the, the x-ray um, and then create the x-ray image uh, from which we then get the CT volume. So, and the basic, basic concept is, is, is very simple. Uh, it just means that the closer we bring our object to our focus spot, so the smaller uh, we make our what we call the FOD, the focus object distance, the smaller that is, the higher our magnification, the bigger the image on our, on our detector. So, and we call the, the distance between the focus spot and the detector, we call it FDD, focus detector distance. So the magnification is a very easy calculation. I think we all, all learned that in, back in high school. Um, it's just the magnification is the focus detector distance, the FDD divided by the FOD, the focal object distance. So if we bring the object halfway, the magnification is two. If we bring it closer, the magnification is bigger and bigger and bigger. Same principle as you uh, you hold your, your, your hand in front of a projector. If you bring your hand closer to the projector, the shadow on the, on the screen will be bigger. Um, just the same principle. So very easy to understand, I think. Um, and then we have one other thing, uh, which we call the voxel size. And so every, every detector, um, consists of a number of, of pixels, as I said, 2,000 by 2,000, or maybe 4,000 by 4,000. And each of these pixels, of course, has a size. The, the, the edge, edge length, I'll, I'll call it, of the pixel. Um, in our case, it would be 200 or 100 micrometers. And if you just take this, this pixel size and divide it by the magnification, this will give you your voxel size. So the voxel size is the smallest element that we have in our CT volume, and I will show that on the next slide. So the voxel size is the edge length of these little little cubes here, and this is basically what a CT volume looks like. It's just a, a whole bunch of, of little cubes, and each of these these cubes has a a gray value assigned to it. So we're, if you want a density of of the material at this particular um, position, and now as we've seen on the on the last slide, the the size or the the length of the edge of this this voxel, and typically they are uh, they are squared. Um, the length of this, of this voxel, or the, what we call the voxel size, depends on pixel size, and this is some, some sort of hardware specification of your detector, and on the magnification. Remember, FOD and FDD are involved. So this is kind of setting the scale of our system, if you want. This is, in the CT world, this, when we talk about metrology, that's all we have. So everything, every measurement that we're doing is basically very simplified, just counting the number of voxels. And of course, we have sub-voxel precision because we, we generate a surface from that and we have statistics. But if the voxel size is wrong, then your measurements will be wrong. 
So everything that we will talk about now in the rest of the presentation is in order to make sure that we have the right voxel size for every voxel, of course. Uh, so we want to have the right voxel size for every voxel because this is setting the scale of our system. If your voxel size is just a few microns too big and you, you have a measurement covering a lot of voxels, it might add up to a few millimeters. So it's really, really important for us as a manufacturer to make sure that if we want to build a CT machine with high accuracy in terms of metrology, that we have this voxel size under control and that we know what it is. We have to know exactly the voxel size and therefore we have to exactly know the magnification, so the geometry of our system, where's our tube, where's our focal spot, where's our sample at the moment, and where's our detector. This is really, I can't stress that enough, this is the most important thing when it comes to CT metrology to have this under control, have the right voxel size, because the voxel size is all the, there's, there's nothing else, that's, that's our scale. So very important for us to, to have this under control, and I will talk a little bit now about, about how we do that in terms of what kind of procedures and what kind of hardware and software solutions do we have to make sure that we have the right voxel size. Um, before we do that, we will have our last question for today. Um, and again, I will read it out and then I'll give you some, some seconds to answer it. Okay, the last question for today is, do you think CT is able to replace existing metrology equipment in your company? And again, I'll just give you a few seconds. Now in this last segment of, of this webinar, as I mentioned before, I want to give you an, an overview of what we do to make our CT systems metrology capable, which as I explained before, just means um, make sure that we have the right scale uh, in the end, the right voxel size for, for each of our, of our voxels. Um, so we're going to have a look at different influencing factors and uh, how we kind of uh, adapted to these challenges and how we made sure that our systems perform the way they do. So the next slides will be basically applicable for all CT metrology systems. Um, this is our, our kind of go-to system at the moment for metrology. It's the Phoenix Vitamex M. Um, and this is a state-of-the-art CT system, comes with different tube configurations, different detectors. Uh, just very important for us here to understand is um, as you see in, in yellow, it is available as a metrology edition. So that means it's an, an option that you can choose if you go for one of these systems. So that means that it is a CT system, a oh, not a basic, but a, a, a just the NDT CT system that you can use for, for all sorts of purposes. And if you want to have accurate measurements uh, with the CT system, you then go for the metrology option, the metrology edition option. And I just want to explain now how what we do with a, let's call it standard CT system, a standard Vitamex M, to make it a metrology edition. So what are the extra steps that we as a manufacturer are doing to give this uh, the system the metrology performance that we need for, for accurate measurements? So every CT system out there on the market, whether it's from Waygate or from, from any other company, basically always have, has the same components. Um, it is some sort of a detector, as I mentioned before. In this case, we're talking about flat panel detectors. Um, it has some sort of manipulator, some CNC-driven axis moving around, um, rotating the part, moving it up and down, left and right, changing magnification. Um, and we have one or, or more X-ray tubes, so an X-ray source where the X-ray is, is generated. And um, these, these three things are also the, the main influencing factors uh, that we uh, discovered on, on CT accuracy. There are other things, and so this is not a complete um, um, list of, of what we do with the metrology system, but in, in my opinion, these are the three main, um, main influencing factors that really can, can give you a hard time when you want to do measurements with a CT. So we, what we're going to do is we want to have a look at each, and, uh, each one of these components one by one, and I was going to try to explain what is the problem with this component uh, when it comes to metrology, and what is our solution as a manufacturer on how we, how we make sure that we, we have this problem covered 
uh, to achieve the, the highest accuracy possible. So we're going left to right, so um, we're going to start with, with a detector. So as I mentioned before, we're talking about flat panel detectors. And the, the problem with these flat panel detectors is they are not flat, at least not on a, on a microscopic scale. So um, as you can see on the right-hand side, these detectors consist of, of several layers. It's shielding, electronics, the active uh, plane, and all these things are mounted somehow together. And in the end, the surface, the active surface, where we actually um, receive the signal um, from the, from the X-ray tube, is not perfectly flat. And why is that a problem? Well, we talked before about the, the magnification, setting the scale of our system, because remember, we need the right voxel size. Otherwise, our measurements will be off. And if, if we have different, uh, different FDDs, focus detector distances, so if the detector is bended, each pixel has a different distance to the tube. So, and, and these, we call it delta FDD, so this, this shift of the pixel will give us for each and every pixel, so in the volume for each and every voxel, will give us a different size, a different magnification. So our, our voxel sizes are not consistent throughout the volume. Each and every voxel has a different magnification, and therefore we get wrong results. So we have to make sure that our, in an ideal world, we would just say, well, just build a flat detector perfectly 100% up to the nanometer flat detector. When we talk to our, our engineers in the USA building these, uh, these detectors uh, from healthcare, they told us, well, we might be able to do that, but then the, the number, the price was just astronomic. So um, doing that is really not an option if you want to have a reasonably priced uh, CT system. So what we came up with in our, in our uh, software engineering department where I used to work is, um, well, if we, can't, if we can't avoid it, if we can't, from a hardware side, make, make the detector flat, then what we can do is we can just measure the unevenness and we can compensate for that. Because one of the other things is each and every detector is different. So um, it's not the same unevenness, let's call it, every time. It's, it's just a kind of randomized um, thing. It, it's um, by the way these things are built, but also by the way they are mounted into the system. You might, uh, you, you can imagine if you just put them into the system, you, it's a few screws, you put them in, and they are never, never, never 100% straight. It's always some slight tilting going on just by, by the accuracy that you can achieve with these kind of mountings. So each system is different, each detector is different, especially when, when they're mounted into the system. What we did is we came up with a solution to measure this unevenness and this tilting um, and correct it because everything that you know, you can correct it, right? So we, what we do is we create what we call a detector map and for each and every pixel on these detectors, which is 4,000 by 4,000 on our, on our high resolution detectors, each and every de pixel gets an, an offset value that we later on then uh, use for compensating these errors. So we know exactly the, the pixel in the row 250 and the, the column 3507 has an offset of 10.57 microns to the ideal geometry. And then we can compensate for that. So we have a solution for that, um, which is compensating the offsets for each and every pixel. So one down, two to go. We have our detector under control. Now let's have a look at the manipulator, the way that things are moved around the system, the moving axis. And once again, very similar to the detector problems we had, is nothing is perfect in this world. So if we are moving these, these axes around, if we're moving from one position to another, um, we are not actually moving in a straight line and we are not moving 100, but maybe 100.002 uh, millimeters. And of course, the, the graph on the right-hand side is highly exaggerated. It's just to give you an, an idea of how this looks. So the axes are just not perfect. and. Um, Again, you, you cannot build a perfect, there's no perfect world, so uh, you cannot build a perfect system, perfectly perpendicular, perfectly straight, all the axes moving around, especially if you think about that we have, some of the systems have a, um, a table where you can put up to 50 or 100 kilograms on it, um, so we have to find another way. And um, again, why is it a problem? Well, if we, especially if you think about the, the magnification, the, which is in our case, we call it the z-axis, the zoom axis, uh, moving the sample closer or to the detector or closer to the tube. Um, if, if this axis is not where we think it is, we have a wrong FOD, focus object distance, so we have a wrong magnification, 
a wrong voxel size, wrong measurement results. So we have to make sure that every time we move the axis, we know exactly where we were and where we're going and where we are at the, and then afterwards. So, uh, and just like with the detector, every, every manipulator system, every CNC system is, is a little bit different uh, just by the tolerances in, in manufacturing these kind of axes. So very similar, we came up with a, with a solution where we compensate these. So we, we do calibrations of all our axes. That's what we call the true position feature in our systems. And by doing that, um, we, we know exactly where we are all the time. So if we, if we tell the system to go from position 100 to position 200, but it's actually going to 199.995, we know that and we can compensate for that. So just kind of the same idea as with a detector. So um, now we, we have a flat detector and we know exactly where our sample is. So now we have the second problem solved. And the nice thing about these two things is, as a customer, getting one of these, these systems installed, you don't really have to worry about that because that's something that we do as a manufacturer. We do it once in our, in our um, factory and then we test it once the system is installed at the customer's um, place and uh, there's normally no, no deviation. If there would be, we would do a recalibration, but typically um, these calibrations are done once and then you can kind of, as a user, you can kind of forget about them. We check them with every maintenance, but from, from, from the user side, we don't really see it. It's just some, some internal things happening, some compensation happening while you're using the system without you even noticing. Now we want to talk about the, the X-ray tube or tubes um, and there things are a little bit different and I'm going to explain why. So once again, let's look at our problem first. The problem is we don't know where our focal spot is. What is the focal spot? It is some, something inside the tube, somewhere hidden inside the, the target material. Um, so it's more or less a virtual point and there's no way of directly measuring it. Um, and to make it even, even worse, it is, it is changing over time. For example, as you can see on the right hand side here, um, we have a so-called dual tube configuration. So you can move the tubes, uh, switch between the tubes, move it back and forth and thereby altering the position of the tube and of the focal spot. So if you, for example, move one of the tubes into position and then out and back in, it is uh, very likely that the focal spot afterwards will not be at the exact same location as it was before um, because, again, we're talking about a few microns here. And so this is a thing that, that happens uh, also during operation of the system. So this is the thing that, that the customer, so that you in the end have to deal with. And therefore, it's a little bit different from the things we talked about before. We needed to find a solution uh, that was redoable by the, by the customer himself um, because we, want, we did not want to send out a service engineer uh, to recalibrate the system every time that you switch your tubes, for example, or change your filament. So what we did is um, we came up with a solution, what we call voxel color. We have a known phantom that you can see uh, in the pictures below uh, with, a, with a couple of uh, ruby spheres on it and the distance between these spheres is calibrated. And therefore, um, we can then do a scan of, these, of this phantom and compare the results to this, to this calibrated uh, nominal values and thereby indirectly measure the focal position by just doing some, some basic math and calculating where the focus spot is supposed to be to, in order to make sure that the lengths are measured correctly. And as I said, this is a, this is a procedure that, that can be done by the customer by just mounting the sample into the, into the system, clicking one button and waiting a couple of minutes and uh, you have your, your result in the end. So you are on your customer side, you are able to reduce this calibration as often as you like um, and, and it is a quick and easy solution. And we don't have to, to send out somebody to do the calibration for you, whereas with a detector and with a, with a manipulator, we do it once in the factory and it stays pretty much um, valid forever. This is a calibration that has to be redone every now and then um, if you switch the tubes or the filament. And it's a very easy solution and it is an indirect measurement, as I mentioned before, because there is no way of measuring this focal spot, this virtual kind of blurry focal spot somewhere inside the material directly. Uh, but it's a very, uh, very co convenient solution to just quickly recalibrate the system. You can also generate a little report and you're sure that your system scale is um, on spot because, again, with this, with this focus spot, you have, remember, the FOD and FDD both consist of this F, so it's F for focus spot, so it's very important we know 
where our focus spot is, and with this particular to, to measure that. So now we finally made it. Everything is nice and green. We have all things under control. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of more things that I didn't cover in this webinar, but these are the three main influencing factors um, that, that we kind of um, discovered and that we, we tackled with this technology. And now we have a system that is metrology capable, so we know exactly the voxel size, we know exactly magnification, everything is nice and perpendicular and flat, and now we can use it for, for accurate measurements. So by leveraging all this technology that I've just shown, we are able on our VTMX M metrology edition system to achieve an accuracy of 3.8 plus L divided by 100 micrometers. This is the sphere distance error according to the VDI 2630. So we are really in a range where we can compete with, uh, with CMMs, with optical scanners, um, and with, with different metrology technology that's out there. So this concludes my webinar for today. Thank you very much for, for listening. Um, we will now uh, start with a Q&A session. So if you have not done already, feel free to um, submit your questions via the Q&A tool. And we, I and we are happy to answer all your questions now. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule today to join us for Metrology by CT, uh, presented by Waygate Technologies, um, a division of Baker Hughes Digital Solutions. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you, uh, Florian Kinnicky, for providing that presentation. It was, it was very insightful. We wanted to start the Q&A portion of our webinar today. So at the bottom of your web browser, you have um, a Q&A console that you are able to uh, type questions in and send them in to uh, Florian for uh, the Q&A session portion. If we have open questions at the end of our session today, we will be following up uh, via email um, from the appropriate people on, on our team. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, Florian, first question. Um, how big is the user influence when using CT for metrology? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, it really depends on how you use your CT system. So uh, I always say the more you can automate, the more you eliminate the, the user influence. So uh, what we try to do, especially in production environments, is use as much automation as possible so that in the end the user influence is only put in the, the sample in, hopefully in a, in a pre-designed uh, sample holder and clicking a button. And thereby you are able to almost completely eliminate the, uh, the user influence. We also did some gauge r and studies in the past where we were able to prove that if we use automation and if you use a proper sample holder, the user has almost no influence. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of different types of questions, some technical in nature um, and just some uh, around some of the systems themselves. So let's start off with a couple of technical questions. So for any given focal spot size, can we calculate what is the minimum realizable voxel size? Okay, so the, the voxel size actually depends on, on your magnification as we have seen in the, in the presentation. So the voxel size itself is just determined by how close can you get your sample to your tube. So if you have a small sample, of course, um, you can move it closer without losing field of view. Um, and then uh, talking about focus spot size, what we have to do is we have to make sure that the focus spot size we're using matches the voxel size that we, that we achieved by using the right magnification. And with these uh, micro-focus tubes that we are using, for example, in this system I've talk, been talking about, we, we can, by reducing the, the energy or the, um, the power output of the, of the tube, we are able to also decrease the, the focus spot size. So what we would do is we would look for the voxel size that we achieved and then adjust the, the tube settings accordingly, make sure that we don't get a, a blurriness or an unsharpness by having a too big focus spot size. Thank you. Um, can you share with us or explain uh, some of the best practices on how to set the uh, surface determination? Yeah, so it depends on, of course, on, on what software you're using. So uh, for my, my trials, typically I'm using Volume Graphics, which is one of the software packages that many, many of our customers use as well. 
And I don't want to go into much detail because this can be quite complex, but generally speaking is uh, use the most precise way of surface determination that you can. And for example, in volume graphic, that would be something that's called advanced surface determination to make sure um, that it, you have sub-voxel precision. So don't, don't build your surface along the edges of your, of your voxels, but have sub-voxel um, sub precision. And again, this is a very complex topic and feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you want to have some further discussions on that. But generally speaking is use the highest accuracy you can get for metrology purposes. For a normal detector, um, how much improvement in accuracy can be obtained with detector pixel compensation? Um, it really depends on the detector because as I've stated before, every detector is different. Of course, we I used to work in engineering and I, I used to do a lot of test runs on different detectors. And well, what, we, what we could see is with, with the detector calibration or with the detector adjustments, we are able to get something like 3.8 microns. Without, we are somewhere just just roughly in the range of, let's say, somewhere between 20 to 40 on these kind of systems. So it's increasing by, or it's, it's bringing the accuracy um, to 10% to of, of what it was before. So factor of 10 roughly. But it really depends on, on, on what kind of detector you're getting because it's a statistic process, how they come out of the factory and how they're mounted. So maybe you're lucky and you're even without calibrations, you're down to 20. Maybe you're not lucky and, and you have 40. If we do the calibration, we have a, we have a certain or we have a way of making sure that you always get the right accuracy which in this case is 3.8 so roughly factor of 10. Great and um, as far as um, CT measurement is concerned how long does a typical CT measurement take? So the, the CT scan itself it really depends on, on what kind of material you're having what kind of resolution you want to achieve we are somewhere between a few minutes, uh, even we can bring it down to a few seconds when you wanna, can, can live with a lack of, of um, quality up to half an hour or an hour, depending on your part. The nice thing is you do one scan even for a lot of different features. So once you have done your scan, you can do all the measurements, let's, let it be 100 features in your part. You just do, have to do the scan once. So it's a one, one scan, um, minutes to 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, really depending on, on what quality you need and what accuracy you need and then you can do all your measurements on this one particular scan. Is there an x-axis option within the metrology, metrology addition systems? Um, the example given is to be able to scan a tall part in section. Yes, so uh, what we have in, in these kind of systems is the so-called multi-scan. As of now, uh, this is not metrology specified. It is so we, we will not be able to achieve the, the 3.8 microns, but you, it will still be much much better than without the calibrations. Um, in the future, there will be a, a fully specified what we call multi-scan, so putting or stitching different different scans together on top of each other. You can already do that. Just the accuracy is not 3.8, but a little bit less. Thank you. And what is the maximum maintenance period duration to remain within spec for calibration for systems like these? So it, it a little bit depends on how uh, how you use your system. We say in a production environment where it is uh, run more or less 24-7 uh, or at least uh, one or two shifts a day, uh, we say every three months or so four times a year um, because we want to make sure that, that the system is always in good condition. And even in between that, uh, we, we offered some tools and some, some software tools and automation for you as a, as a user to do your own validation of the measurement accuracy. So uh, we have customers doing that every month, for example. They say every first of the month, they do a quick um, validation of the system uh, just to make sure that everything for the internal um, um, gu um, guidelines, following the internal guidelines to make sure that the system is, is performing accurately. We, we recommend doing it every three months of maintenance. Okay. What is the smallest feature size we can measure with CT? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer because it really depends on the size of your, of your part itself. If you think about how these, how these things look, you have a tube and you have this rotating table. And what we always have to do is we have to do a full rotation of the part. So if you have a small part, um, you can move it close to the tube and have a full rotation. If it's a big part, you might not be able to get as close because um, you might hit your tube while rotating. So, and we've seen before that the, the magnification, thereby the voxel size, the resolution, is only dependent on the, on the physical position of the part in the system. So the 
theoretically, you are able to, with these kind of systems, the limitation is somewhere within five to six microns from a hardware side, if you have a small enough sample to, to scan it. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do you obtain the 3.8 micron number? What measurement do you make? So the 3.8 plus L divided by 100 is, um, is regarding the VDI 2630 guideline. I, I'm, I didn't really cover it in this, in this webinar because it would kind of be out of scope for, for this uh, one hour. But there is a, a VDI guideline stating on how to exactly do these measurements. And what we're measuring here is the so-called sphere distance error. So it's the, the error between two defined spheres um, in, inside, a, inside a measurement volume. And we can, we are, we're giving the guarantees that if you measure the distance between two spheres, uh, the deviation or the, from the nominal will be less than 3.8 microns. Yeah, so if you want to look it up, it's the so-called um, uh, VDI 2630. Thank you. Um, in your experience, um, it was referenced that the decay on the filament of the tube can potentially be considered an issue for measurement and magnification. Is there any sort of best practices around um, the, that care? Yes, yeah, so um, as, as I mentioned, we have this what we call voxel calip to, to calibrate or to measure the, the focal spot position. Um, this is a procedure that on a, on a 200, uh, 300 kV system with a 200 micron detector takes seven to eight minutes. So our recommendation really is, when you have the time, do it as often as possible, just as, especially for you as an internal validation to make sure that your system is, let's say, on spot, um, especially when you're running it at, at very high powers all the time and really stressing the system, we recommend doing it more often, more frequently. Um, but you have all the, all the procedures in place uh, on these metrology edition systems to do the recalibration as often as you like. We have customers, for example, that run the, the system more or less 24 seven, and they do it with every morning shift. So every morning, the first person that comes in is doing this, this calibration eight minutes, and then they start their daily routine, and next day they redo it. So that's something that I would recommend if you're really stressing the system a lot and having it in a full production environment, let's say. Thank you. Um, next question is, are there any safety concerns regarding radiation for, for systems like this? And what has been your experience with that? So the simple answer is no, there's not. So these, these systems are built as fully proofed um, um, radiation safe systems. So the cabinet design ensures that there's no radiation outside of the system. So there's no need of having any, uh, wearing any protective gear, any dosimeters, anything. So all, all our systems, all these systems, and not only ours, to be honest, all the systems on the market in, in this kind of segment are all fully proofed. So you can, I always say, basically, you can put them in a kindergarten without any, any dangers. So it's really, there's no, no uh, restrictions on, on how, to, how to operate them. Um, so there's no radiation coming out at any time. Thank you so much. Um, we are about to come up on our last question for our session of the day. I wanted to let the participants know that um, at the end of this session, we do have a very, very brief survey. This helps us identify um, some future subjects, um, future uh, industrial trends that you would like to discuss or you would like to have some of our subject matter experts present on. Um, Florian, the, the final question is, um, again, technical in nature. So uh, this is in regards to what is the L in, in, the, in, in the equation, right? What is the best case measurement error we would be willing to quote? And what are some of the best practices around um, that? Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned before, the L is for the, uh, the length measurement, uh, sorry, the sphere distance error regarding the VDI 2630. And the the measurement error then is a combination, if you look into the VDI at least, it's a combination of, of this error on top of, of the so-called form and, and size error probing. And um, so for, for regarding the VDI guideline, we're somewhere in the range of 10 microns, um, but the, that doesn't really answer the question, what is with my particular part? And what I always say is we have to, we have to try. So what we always do is we take, take the particular application and we see because there's so many influencing factors like material, like the, the density, like the geometry of, this, of the part. So we really have to make sure that we do proper GNR studies and MSA studies to, to really answer this question. And that's also the best practice. If you really want to know the performance on your particular part, 
best practices, reach out to me or one of our sales colleagues and make sure we do some demonstration on your real life part to make sure that we can prove to you or show you how good the, the measurement accuracy will be on this particular part. Thank you so much, Florian. And thank you so much, um, everyone who took time out of their day to, to join us. Um, I hope you found it um, insightful. I, I certainly know that I did. Um, as a follow-up, we will be um, providing um, additional sort of resources and responses to any of the open questions. And we wish you a, a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful weekend as well. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, everybody.